I'm going to introduce you to Den uh, Dr. Denise Turner. Welcome, Denise. Thank you so much, Iona, um, and welcome, everybody. Um, as Iona has said, my name's Denise Turner, and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Chichester. Um, and I'm really delighted to be invited here today. Uh, Social Work England invited me to talk a, a little bit about the work that I've done during COVID around loss and bereavement. Um, and I wanted to do that through the theme of hope. Uh, so we have a lot of slides to get through today. And um, Einar is going to act. I'm going to do my sort of Chris Witty bit. And Einar is going to act as um, my slide person. So um, during this session, really, I want to look at um, various ways that we took people with us during COVID, um, thinking about the theme of Social Work Week this week, no one left behind. Um, and like I say, framing that around hope so that uh, we can think about different projects that I was involved with that gave voice to loss. So next slide, please, Inara. And I wanted to do that through um, a legend that many of you will be familiar with. So that's where the hope inside the box comes from. Uh, all of you will know the legend of Pandora's box. When she opens the box, all the illnesses and hardships of the world are released and Pandora is frightened by what she's unleashed. She tries to close the box as fast as possible and she leaves hope clinging to the lid. And I think I, if you will just bear with me before I get on to the kind of hope bit, um, I think there are real parallels between what COVID has put us all through and the myth of Pandora's box. In, in many ways, the, um, the ills of the world have been released upon us. And um, just bear with me while I sort of help us think about some of these things and then move on to, as I've said, some of the projects that I was involved with that, that, that put the hope back. Um, so as we all know, there's been a lot of deaths. Um, and not just deaths, there's also been a lot of loss, loss of familiarity, um, loss of freedom at times, loss of familiar workplaces and colleagues, all sorts of primary and secondary losses, as well as the deaths that many people have experienced. We also know that it's put people at a significantly increased chance of mental health conditions, um, particularly anxiety and depression, and also that loneliness has risen. Um, a lot during COVID. And all of those things will be things that you as social workers will have been dealing with yourselves at times, but also in your work. Next slide. So um, another ill, Ill of the world, uh, as I've talked about a bit, is, is the amount of bereavements, the amount of actual deaths that have happened during COVID. And then there's the secondary losses that people have experienced. Research, lots of research shows that psychological distress is intensified in people who were bereaved as a result of COVID. Um, so that, again, is something that, that, that you may, as I've said, have been dealing with as social workers, but also in your work. Next slide. This is... Um, you know, quite quite a, a pause for thought. Um, the death rate amongst female social workers of working age was one of the highest for women of any profession. Um, and this is from a survey during last year, 2021. So, um, and similarly, three in four deaths involving COVID-19 in, in social care occupations involve care workers and home carers. So the toll on social work and social care has been great. And again, I imagine that many of you will have experienced this and can relate to some of these figures. Next slide, thanks. And my last ill of the world um, is just to talk about actually, during the kind of main parts of COVID, there was a lot of celebration of um, the NHS, rightly so, um, and of other kind of sectors, but we didn't really hear that same sort of celebration about social work. Uh, I know there was a survey, I think it was last year, that described social work as the forgotten frontline. Um, 
And what happened, of course, as all of you will know, um, towards the end of last year, when there were these two um, children who died, there was, a, a again, a sort of depressingly familiar uh, coverage of social work in some of the papers over the deaths of these children. But, but, but prior to that, very little celebration. And I've put that there in my kind of COVID-19 and the ills of the world. OK, so from all of this, I think what I would argue um, is that we've all been through a form of collective trauma, basically. Um, and that trauma is still with us. Uh, it's not gone away, as um, the Prime Minister might like us to think. You know, it's with the ending of restrictions isn't the ending of the virus, as we know, uh, incidents are still going up. And also that we haven't all been in it together. That was very much the message at the start of the pandemic, that actually deaths, as we know, have um, been much higher amongst people of colour. And many groups have experienced much more serious and long lasting effects than others. So, um, you know, just sort of thinking around that that theme of trauma, if we can have the next slide. Um, this is from Arundhati Roy's essay, um, and it's it sort of sums that trauma up. So she says, whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. So that's part of what I want to be doing with you here today. And I hope, you know, you'll excuse that slightly depressing start to this. Um, I want to talk about um, the ways in which we can overcome that rupture and um, and also about some of the ways in, in which I was involved with projects that, that did that. And to, to link that to theory and to situate that, um, what many kind of modern theorists say, bereavement and loss theorists, is that um, meaning making or meaning reconstruction is a critical thing in, in the way that we come to terms with trauma, or, or complicated and difficult losses. So meaning making is going to be very much a theme of my talk today. Thanks, Ayana. And as I've said, you know, the title of this session is Hope. Uh, hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and a desire for a particular thing to happen. So as we go through this talk today, um, I'd encourage you just to think about what's your definition of hope. If you want to, you can type it into the chat. But I think it's it's important to think about what do you hope for and what does hope look like for you moving out of this pandemic uh, with, with all that has happened within it. And just another bit of theory here. Um, this is from Thomas Attig's work, and some of you may know it, some of you may not. But um, when Attig's talking about grief or mourning or overcoming trauma, what he talks about is uh, relearning the world. So what he says is that um, when we've been through a, a, a form of loss, whether that's individual or collective, the world changed, the world shifts in some sort of way. And so part of what we have to do, I can see all these lovely hopes <laughs> coming in. Thank you very much for those. Um, and as I and Iris said, we'll have some time at the end to think about these and to ask some questions. Um, so moving back to Attic, he says that we can choose to some extent, even if it's in tiny, tiny ways, how we reshape our lives. Um, but what we have to do is we have to learn how the world looks now um, compared to how it looked before. And we have to relearn that that world. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope so. Um, so next slide, please. So what I'm going to tell you about, as I've said, these are so lovely. I'm getting distracted looking at them. <laughs> um, being slower. Yes, I, I will talk about some of these things. Um, I want to tell you about some projects that I've been involved with that I hope will be useful to think about. I hope they might also be um, inspirational in some sort of way um, for things that you might like to do yourselves or um, work that you might like to get involved with. 
so there's a lot of these projects. I will whip through them really quickly. Um, so forgive us for that, but um, we want to leave time at the end. So the first of these um, projects is something called Stars in Memory and then um, a project called Moment in Time. And both of these projects I delivered with uh, the National Care Forum, which um, many of you will know of, and an organisation called NAPA, which is the National Activity Providers Association. And both of these organisations do a lot of work in the social care sector, particularly around care homes. NAPA um, is an amazing organisation that, that delivers activities, creative activities to the social care sector. So I want to tell you um, a little bit about the projects that we did. Thank you, Ainara. You're reading my mind here, changing these slides. Um, and they're both linked to um, a form of hope, which is around making memories. And a lot of research has shown that memories are very important to us when we have been through some sort of significant loss or trauma. Um, we need we need to be able to in order to be to be able to make meaning, we need to be able to make memories. And part of the goal in that is to foreground the good memories, to remember the bad memories, but also to 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 find a way of making meaning from those. So lots of research has shown that positive memory makings linked to all sorts of good outcomes in terms of emotional well-being. So going back to my original slides, the kind of anxiety and depression that that have come about as a result of COVID, much of that can be mitigated um, by this focus on making meaning through memory. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these projects. Next slide. Thanks, Ainara. So the first of these, and this was the first, as, as far as we know, the first kind of national day of remembrance and laid the ground for subsequent ones. Um, as I've said, it was delivered with NAPA and with the NCF, um, and it was an invitation to people to put a star up in their window if they suffered a bereavement or a significant loss. And this was in um, 2020, in, in June 2020, so very shortly after the first lockdown. Somebody said, I still have my star. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you. Um, we did this very quickly because uh, obviously the first lockdown was in March and we delivered this project in June. But it felt incredibly important at that time and has done ever since that actually people had a, a way of collectively showing and demonstrating to the outside world because we were still in a period of lockdown during some of this time. Um, what was going on for them just to show, you know, this has happened for me. Uh, so we delivered it very quickly and we had over immediately over 30 partners um, who helped us with this. Next slide. I just want to show you um, who some of those partners were. So lots of people came on board with this. And I like to think that, um, as I say, it laid the ground for some of the kind of more kind of uh, national projects that have come since. Um, next slide. And you can see from these slides, all these are pictures of all the lovely stars um, that, that people did. This is a doorway um, that somebody completely decorated with stars. And I hope what these um, slides are showing is, is partly what I've been talking about, the, the need to make meaning and the need um, to go back to the theme of Social Work Week this week, that the idea that no one is left behind, that even if people at a period of lockdown are feeling quite isolated, you know, um, they've experienced a lot of different losses that actually just by that act of putting a little star in their window, they're suddenly joined um, in some kind of collective form of, of remembrance. And then that helps to build hope and to give meaning. So that's Stars in Memory. I, I realise that I'm, as I said, sort of whistle stopping through these projects. Um, so um, please do ask questions if, if you want to know anything at the end. And then moving forward from Stars in Memory um, to last year, to 2021, uh, again with the National Care Forum and with NAPA, 
we started to think around uh, moving out of um, the lockdowns, the social distancing and restrictions. Um, and we wanted to start thinking about how do people remember this time? Um, so again, very much going back to that focus on memory making and meaning making and, and thinking about building memories for posterity. And again, as I've said before, memory work has been shown to be very, very positive um, in, in helping people to recover from or to just cope with certain kind of um, mental health issues, but and also just to build that hope and that meaning making. So again, we came up with this project called Moment in Time 21. And, and what that uh, was is just an invitation to make we called them moments in time boxes, but they're also um, called time capsules, just memory boxes. And um, I've got some photos here to show you of some of the memory boxes that, that people made. And this was, if you could put the next slide up, Ayanara. So here are some of the lovely memory boxes. You can see that, and these were made by um, our social care colleagues, people in care homes working with um, NAPA and the NCF. And um, I think, as Ayanara said at the beginning, actually, these always never fail to move me um, when I look at these. And you can see this this one here, the belong moment in time, the, the amount of effort that people went to um, to produce these boxes. We also produced a little film, um, which we're just going to show you here. This is... This is um, a film of uh, my family's memory box, in fact, and we're using that because we have consent to use it. So, but hopefully it will kind of bring the project to life for you as well. Denise, could you please let me know if you can hear the sound? Just give me a nod. Thank you. OK. Yeah. Thanks so much, Anara. So um, as I say, that was my family's um, memory box because uh, we have consent to use that one. But we we had all sorts of other videos that were made, um, lots and lots of really fantastic kind of creative contributions to this project. Um, I also wanted to say, if we can go to the next slide, 
that oh it's going to start playing again <laughs> um that it's not too late to join in um it's the boxes are going to be opened in june um this year um and then the idea is that people save them um because we've all lived through a very significant time together so uh, all the resources that you see there are on the National Care Forum and the NAPA website that you can download um, and use to decorate your boxes if, if you want to join in or if you have worked with people that you think would benefit from, from doing this, please do join in, it's still not too late. So um, yeah, next slide please. Uh, yes, so I wanted to talk a little bit about making digital connections and um, in doing this, I need to add the caveat that, you know, there are many people that are still digitally excluded um, and, you know, have only during COVID had access to to phones. I mean, I had a, a student that, that was writing their dissertation on their phone. They didn't have access to a laptop or anything. Um, so I just want to add that caveat before I kind of move on and talk a little bit about some of the digital connection that I was privileged to be part of during this time. So next slide. Um, the first um, thing I just wanted to share with you was something called Padlet. Um, I don't know if if you know about Padlet. If you don't, um, it's a kind of virtual bulletin board that you can use to connect people. So it, 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 it's just like a sort of cork board um, that you might put on the wall, but instead it's on the Internet. And it's a way that people can share visuals, um, comments, poems, all sorts of things and this one connecting social work during social isolation we set up during the March 2020 so in the very early part of the lockdown um, and it became part of Baswa's top tips for well-being and I've just quoted um, Rachel who I think is here today hello Rachel um, who said uh, that Padlet helped her find humanity during this really difficult time where we were locked down, we didn't know what had happened to us, really. I think lots of people were reeling from that, that actually this um, this virtual way of connecting became quite a lifeline for the for the community that used it. And people posted all sorts of, of things onto it, um, poems, drawings, reflections. Um, and as I say, it became um, there's Rachel. <laughs> Um, it became a real community uh, and, and it's it's very simple. So next slide. Uh, this isn't a shameless plug, I promise. Um, through the Padlet community, um, what what we realised was that actually um, there was a, a, a lot of voices out there that, that kind of needed to be given voice to. So um, this was an early publication. Um, again came out at the beginning of last year and it brought together different voices, um, students, experts by experience um, and practitioner voices, just talking about their experiences during that first part of the lockdown. And um, again, many this was put together digitally. So we never met as a group, the people that contributed to this book, it was all through digital connection, which of course we're so much more familiar with now in so many ways than we were at the beginning of the pandemic. So, um, and through that digital connection, um, we produced a, another book, next slide please, um, which also, as it's just been released, that's purely about digital connection, um, but this time including health. So this is my co-editor, Michael, um, who is um, a health, a senior lecturer in health. Um, and we've looked at how did agencies work together? So we've got some fantastic chapters in this book, but the, the reason that I've included it here today is because, again, this was a virtual community. These were people who came together, um, who'd never met each other, but um, who formed another community and that takes me back to that very early message about no one being left behind, about trying to give voice to people's experiences, which might resonate and be helpful. And I'm just going to share with you um, a couple of sort of 
chapters. Yeah, that's fine, Einara. That's fine. Um, so as I've said, it's 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 a book that speaks to health as well as to social work and to that kind of in idea of integrated care and interdisciplinary practice. But I included this chapter, which is um, by Craig Harmon, who is um, one of the heads of the St John Ambulance, because what he says in his chapter is St John is built around human connection. And I think that's that's a real theme for me that people often talk about the digital as being kind of um, impersonal um, and that you lose things through it. But I think actually during the pandemic, uh, it's been an absolute lifeline for those people that have been lucky enough to have that access. Uh, it's been a way of really building that digital um, and human connection. And Craig's chapter speaks to, it's so impressive, how St John moved all of their training um, online um, to slow the spread of the virus. So next slide, please. And this one is written by um, the British Association of Social Worker, Baz the Baswa students who do the Twitter social media for Baswa. And again, I wanted to include this because what they talk about, you can see there's a lot of them. And what they talk about in their chapter is that, that virtually through coming together digitally um, during the pandemic, um, they found friendships, as they say, that would never have evolved if it wasn't for social media and that they've supported each other um, as what they call the virtual generation of social work students. So those that started during the pandemic. And for me, going back to that message of hope, um, it feels very hopeful that people have been able to make these communities, even when things have been really difficult, there has still been that striving to make community to come together in some way with that message of no one left behind. So I hope all this is making sense. Like I say, we, we will leave some time for questions. And so moving on, um, these are some similar projects that I'm currently involved with. Um, and I do welcome interest or questions on these. Building on the projects that I've already talked about, we're, we're currently working on a project called Memories from the Forgotten Frontline. And that's a quote from um, a report that came out last year and that I shared with you earlier, just talking about social work as the forgotten frontline. And this project is a digital archive. Um, what it's doing is it's, it's inviting social workers to send in a photograph. So it's, it's not a very arduous thing to do. It's not a survey, it's not an interview, it's, not, um, it's just inviting people to send in a photograph uh, under these four categories. So we have belonging and connection, home and away, health and well-being and loss and change. And then with their photograph, just to say something in a few words about why they've chosen this category and, and this photo. So I've put some examples up here. And as you can say, see, this one's under belonging and connection. And the person says, my Nintendo Switch is the most prominent memory of the pandemic for me. It was through this that all my social interaction happened. So again, just that kind of real striving for, for connection and for meaning. Next slide, thank you. And this one is, is about loss and change. Um, and it shows something that was completely unknown to us just over two years ago. Uh, we wouldn't have even known what this was really. We might have thought it was a pregnancy test, I suppose. Um, but here is a discarded lateral flow test, um, something that we'll all be very familiar with now. And the writer has said that they they chose it for that reason. Um, it was something that they wouldn't have recognized that now is so common. And the test is negative. <laughs> um, so, you know, and it's next to the shoots of a spring bulb. So it's kind of offering some form of hope for the future. Just moving back to that theme of hope again. And one of the last things that I want to talk about is um, Again, another project that uh, we are involved with that's to do with mental health and wobble spaces. Um, I'll talk to you about wobble spaces in a minute. Um, but just framing this project, uh, I'm moving back to Attig again, who and his ideas about relearning the world. 
And what Ashik says is that when people experience a significant loss, um, they want to be listened to, basically. They want to be listened to, they want to be understood, and they, they want um, to be supported. And this second quote is from one of the books that I showed you. Um, it's on it's a chapter about safeguarding children during the pandemic. And and what they're saying in the chapter, as you can see, is that holding risk in isolation is anxiety provoking, stressful and ultimately unsafe. We need cohesive, integrated professional networks which are vital in creating an environment for practitioners to work together. And we, thinking about those things, um, worked on some workshops in some of the London boroughs. Uh, we called them, can I have the next slide please, Ainara? Um, some mental health, mental wealth and well-being workshops. I worked on these with a colleague from Goldsmiths University um, and we launched these five two-hour workshops, mental wealth and well-being, where we brought social workers together um, to give them a space, basically, to give them a space to talk about what they had experienced during the pandemic. And these workshops were themed, so we had spaces for, for talking, spaces for poetry, um spaces for memory making different different kind of themes for the workshops and i just want to share with you in the next slide a bit of learning from these workshops um these were some themes and one of the striking quotations that that came through was somebody said um that prior to the pandemic they realized that their identity had become their lanyard um, so they were so immersed in work that actually they 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 couldn't see anything but that anymore. And they had begun to realise how dangerous that was. Um, and through the pandemic, people talked, despite the losses and despite all the things that they'd been through, people started to, to speak about, very similar to the Padlet that I showed you, uh, they, they'd been for walks in their local neighbourhood that and they discovered places that they didn't know were there before um, they'd you know done the kind of classic listening to the birds or baking the bread or whatever it, it you know but but there was a real focus on actually we've been through so much and we need now to be able to think about our self-care how do we how do we look after ourselves and that's what I want to to move us on to now so what we learned from these workshops is that there's a real need for connection um, and for some sort of therapeutic type of supervision. Um, people talked about um, the cost effectiveness of that, that actually if you invest in staff, then the retention rates will go up, um, the sick rates will go down. And also just the benefit of, again, of working in partnership. We delivered these workshops as a university and local authority partnership, and we learned a lot from each other. Um, and through that, if I could have the next slide. Through that, what we're now doing is we're setting up a, a series of what's called virtual wobble spaces um, in West Sussex, and, and it's a partnership with Goldsmiths and, and Chichester University, which is my institution. I don't know if you're familiar with wobble rooms. Um, they're quite, they're physical spaces that are quite widely used in the NHS. Um, and they are, as they say, a place to go and have a wobble. Um, so they tend to be kitted out with um, some sort of, you know, colouring, leaflets, signposting to counselling services or whatever music um but a place uh, where people can can go and sort of have this wobble and an acknowledgement that people need that the problem with the physical spaces is that they are physical spaces so sometimes they're in different buildings or they're locked at five o'clock or people just don't have time to decide right i'm going to have my wobble in five minutes so i'm going to walk over and and have it um have it then so so we've taken that idea and we're setting up uh, a series of of wobble of virtual wobble spaces and as we were working on this project um 
someone, um, Rachel, who who used to be a student of mine, I noticed had put these um, posts up on Twitter and I do have Rachel's permission to use them. So you know, what she's saying here is that actually, you know, she shouldn't have to pay for private therapy, um, that that um, moral injury, vicarious trauma is is a reality for social workers. It always has been, um, but I think it's even more so due, uh, because of COVID and the things that we've spoken about today. So as you can see there, Rachel also is talking about wobble rooms and it, it really resonated with me because um, we're setting up this project at the moment. So thank you, Rachel, for letting me use your, your messages. So just moving on before we finish, because I'm very keen that, that we have this 10 minutes for any questions. Um, the basis of these wobble rooms is this idea. I don't know. I'm old enough to remember these. There may be some of you here today that also are. Um, weebles. Does anyone remember weebles? Um, the idea of weebles was that they wobbled, but they didn't fall down. Um, and <laughs> thank you, Nancy. Um, and that's what we're hoping to achieve. Um, that's a sort of simple message from our virtual wobble spaces that we give people a, a place to wobble. And in doing that, they don't fall down, basically. So moving us right back before I finish, how does all this link to hope? How do we go back to Pandora's box? You know, we're still clinging onto the lid. Um, and that made me think of, of this. Uh, I often say this to my students when we go on a plane, you know, and the flight crew give you a safety display that says, put your oxygen mask on first before you help anyone else. Um, and I know that when I when I flew, when my children were very young, I used to it used to absolutely panic me because I used to think, well, how can I possibly do that before I've put theirs on? Um, but of course, we have to. You know, and I think that's such a, a strong metaphor. We have to be able to look after ourselves. However, we do that through um, wobbling, <laughs> you know, through through connection, through yoga, through walking, you know, connecting with our locality, whatever it is, we have to um, we have to make sure that we we get our own oxygen first. And I've just put with that this quotation, it's a very old one now, but it, it makes a lot of sense to me. The, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and lost daily and not be touched by it is, a, is as unrealistic as expecting to walk through water without getting wet. This is from um, a survey, Social Work Union survey, um, and this does link to hope, I promise you, um, which dis which found that the mental health of two thirds of social workers had deteriorated because of, of um, COVID, because of the pressures that they'd been under. And in response to this survey, a DfE spokesperson called social workers our unsung heroes. Um, so uh, next slide, please. I think we have to however we do it and partly we're doing it here today and we've been doing it through social work week um, and in all the different ways um, that I've shown you some of the projects that I've shown you today we have to make sure that we um, give people voice that we find new ways of moving forward um, and that we allow this wobbling this uh, but also find these different ways of finding different creative ways. So in the in the boxes that I showed you in the stars, just very sort of simple ideas that unite people um, together and sing sing the song of social work. Next slide, please. So I'm nearly at the end. Um, and thank you for bearing with me through this. I wanted to, this is almost my last slide. Um, I wanted to again, go back to Aaron Dirty Roy's really beautiful essay and if you haven't read it I really recommend that you do because what she says is that actually um, we have an opportunity we've been through a, a terrible time um, but we also have an opportunity here and so uh, she says as you can see historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world in you this one is no different it's a portal it's a gateway between one world and the next 
And and I really agree with that. I think we have an opportunity here to to maybe look after social work, social workers differently, um, and we can fight for that. And um, there is an exercise that I do when I do workshops with people, which uh, I thought it might just be useful to say today, which you can go, it's very low tech, and um, you can go and do it after the end of social work week if you want, where you just divide a piece of paper into three columns. In one column, you say what you want, what you want to remember. In another column, you say what you want to leave behind. And in the next, you just say what you want to take forward. Um, and although it sounds very simple, it's actually been very powerful for people. Um, so I think that's that's something to think about as we move forward. So I'm going to almost end just again on the theme of social work week this year, thinking about the environment, thinking about not leaving people behind. Um, the Digital Connections book, which I shared with you earlier, the last chapter in it is written by Dr. Sandra Engstrom, who is a social work academic in Scotland. Um, and she really echoes what Aaron Dutty Roy says, that moments of crisis provide us with opportunities to reflect on our own worldviews and our day to day lives. There's no longer any room to deny the trajectory that we're on. Social workers are trained to challenge, to think creatively, to work holistically and to attend to injustice. And she says we have to think about including environmental injustice. So what is happening to the planet in our in our thinking. And that's nearly the end. Um, moving back to relearning the world. Um, what Attic says is stories at the heart are at the heart of the matter. Um, and I hope what I've been able to show you today is um, some different ways of telling stories. So they, they don't necessarily need to be in words. They can be in video. They can be in music. They can be put inside boxes. Um, but I think telling these stories for of social work, of our practice, of what we've been through during this pandemic are really important. And I'm going to leave you, you can tell I really like this essay with um, this, just this last slide. Again, Aradati Roy, where she says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way on a quiet day. I can hear her breathing. And that very much, I hope, is a message of, of hope, which is where we started today. And, um, and also, as I've said, speaks to the theme of not leaving anyone behind. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your time. And we've got 10 minutes um, now for questions. If I have to say so myself, that's perfect timing. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. I think I'm going to ask um, my colleague Vicky and Kirsty maybe to support to some of the questions. People might also want to uh, maybe um, switch on their microphone if they want to ask questions. Really, thank you for insightful presentation. I have learned so much myself. Oh, good. Really somebody good. Me, I know. Just before um, we move to questions, yeah. somebody said, um, uh, "What were the three columns?" So, um, I mean, really, you can you can do whatever you like. You know, it's um, but but what I've done um, in yeah. workshops is is to just say what what you want to forget. Uh, what you want to, to remember and then what, what lessons really you want to take forward. Thank you. So there is there is somebody who's got their hand up at the moment. So I don't know, Tina, if you wanted to ask a question. Would you unmute your microphone? Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, for some reason I've not got the chat facility. Um, Denise, thank you very much. That was a really very positive talk, but I just wanted to raise something. As a disabled and clinically vulnerable social worker, I, with your message of not feeling anyone left behind, I felt my community's voice was absent in the presentation today. I'm really sorry to say it. Um, just to say that we're talking about renewed freedoms. There's an assumption, but there's many people who are clinically vulnerable like myself who are still continuing to shield. This has not ended for us. We've got 60% of people who died of COVID in the UK were disabled, where we're only 20% of the population. 
and we've now got 1.3 million with long COVID and that's not even addressing the mental health thing. So what the question was really was what has been done to encourage Engage to make sure the experiences of our community, the clinically vulnerable and the disabled community are not ignored and forgotten because I, I didn't feel very heard in the presentation today. Oh, and I know with uh, so sorry about that, it's Tina. Difficult. It's it's um and I, you certainly I'm really sorry that didn't come through and you certainly are, are not ignored. I mean, in in um I guess in in any sort of presentation and in in, in you know just in an hour I there's always choices to be made. But what I can say to you is that that one of the books that that I um spoke about there is there is a, a chapter that was written by um, Varsha Taylor who is um, a, a woman who uh, is clinically vulnerable exactly as you've described who um, uh, describes sole author the chapter um, and describes her experiences really powerfully so her voice is 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 I think one of the most important chapters in that book and what was so again important about that is that we we managed to do that by creating this kind of online community so we managed to include her in this way and that meant that she was able to write the chapter it meant that she didn't have to come out and meet us or you know stop shielding um in order to do that and yet she was able to get her voice heard um so No, thank you very much. That was really helpful to hear that. And that the memory box, um, the memory boxes that I was showing you, the moment in time and the stars in memory, um, those projects were entirely delivered with social care where a lot of the people were actually really clinically vulnerable and not able to, you know, get out at all. Um, and they were... I mean, it, it sort of makes me almost tear up talking about them, actually, because they were so powerful. One of the reasons that I shared my video and not not the videos that other people made was because um, we we didn't we didn't have consent to show them because they were so powerful for people, actually, you know, and they didn't necessarily want those shown on on a big platform like this. But 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 those projects absolutely speak to the heart of what you've said and you know it's my responsibility if I didn't if I didn't get that over Tina but but you know certainly um they were very very inclusive projects that actually enable people to have their voices heard I hope that helps oh thank you very much that was really nice to just have that perspective because I think it, we were as a group we um the disabled community feels like um our disability rights have actually been gone back gone backwards and um, through COVID. So it's really nice to hear that we've been thought of. Thank you. And I've really appreciated the talk. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, Tina. And you know, I would I would I really want to emphasize that actually the 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 moment in time and the stars in memory projects were were, you know, people who were shielding were at the absolute heart of those. And that's why they were so important, actually, because they did get those people's voices and represent them. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Vicky, do we have other questions? Maybe we in the chat? I'm thinking yeah. most of the thing that I'm mostly seeing comments coming in the chat. I'm not seeing any questions, but if I've missed anything, if people want to unmute themselves and ask or put their hands up, because I'm seeing mo I'm seeing a lot of grateful comments. Um, I'm seeing people talking about enjoying the book. Um, and there was there were some comments from um, Michelle earlier on, who's a palliative care social worker, and talking about the impact of COVID and some of the life story work and identity work that they do to enhance memory making and giving meaning, obviously following in with that theme, and, and Valerie Bond talking about using the theme actually at Christmas in their church and inviting schools to send in stars and and putting the stars up through the church so there are people sharing experiences and comments but I can't see any specific questions I know somebody was asking about slides and the slides will be sent out and about recordings but, but a lot of appreciation and thank yes, you very much lots of appreciation thank you and just to go back to, to Tina I think um it's you know it always feels awkward to me because it feels like I'm sort of plugging plugging a book but um I would really recommend if you if you can possibly get a hold of a copy in the library or whatever of um, of 
uh, the the social work and COVID book and and read Varsha's chapter. It's I I think it you know will really speak to your experience. It's an amazing chapter, and I'm so sort of proud of her for writing it. She'd never written anything before um, in that sort of way. So and it, and it you know as I've said, it really speaks to that experience. Thank you again, Denise. I must say once again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I'm very much aware it's a Friday. Friday afternoon has been a busy week for everyone. I, I'm sure that everybody's going to join me in saying how much we have learned and we really appreciate such an insightful session. As a social worker myself, I have learned a lot. Um, I'm going to say that uh, to all participants in this meeting, we hope you have enjoyed this session. We also hope that um, you're going to take the time to complete a quick survey, which I believe my colleague uh, is going to share now in the chat around a feedback around what we can do to improve social quick for next year. Promise you we are going to have one next year. We hope with your contribution too. And also, a quick reminder, Denise, this is not particularly for you, but for everybody else who is a social worker, please remember that you could consider this session as part of meeting your CPD professional standard requirements. Um, so you could, if you plan to, also to discuss with one of your peers and maybe have some reflection that's going to support you. Talk to your colleague. Thank you, Vicky. A really clear <laughs> message from my colleague in the chat. Talk to your colleague and consider if this reflection of, or the reflection on this workshop might support you to meet the peer, um, the CPD peer requirement too. Therefore, um, that would be a great opportunity in my view, particularly so much to think about and so much to probably embed in our practice. That's my view, Denise, and that is going to improve our social practice. Thank you again to all of you joining us today. We hope to see you at our closing session, which is going to start in half an hour. Denise, thank you once again and you. Um, see you soon. Thank, thank you. you very much. Take care.